Hello, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, where today we're going to look at um, quite an advanced technique, uh, which is the swordfish, and in fact the finned swordfish, which is an even more exotic variation on that particular fish. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, there are sort of stages of fish in uh, Sudoku terminology. So the simplest um, is not a fish at all, it's called an X-wing. Uh, and we'll look at look at one of those very quickly in a moment, just to remind ourselves of, of what an X-wing is. Then we move up from an X-wing to a swordfish, which is just adds one more dimension onto an X-wing. After that, something called a jellyfish, and then after that, it's called a squirm bag. Now you don't see many squirm bags, and uh, they really do. Um, uh, well, they're very rare, and also spotting one without the help of a computer is, I think, almost impossible. Uh, so we're not going to cover those, but we'll look at we'll look at swordfish today. So, first of all, though, what is an X-wing? Because if we can fix what an X-wing is, understanding what a swordfish is is not too difficult. So let's imagine that we had a puzzle, and we were looking at the rows, and we found that in row two. We could only place a four in these two positions. And we looked at row eight and we found exactly the same thing. We could only place a four in these two positions. Well, this creates the standard X-wing pattern. And it's called an X-wing because I'll, I'll put some notes, some graphics on at the end. But in, in effect, these this box forms an X pattern. And enables us to use some nice logic because whichever way around we arrange the fours we know that there won't be any more fours in column four and column six so let's for example say that this was the real four in row two if this was the real four then that would force this to be a real four and that you can see clearly there couldn't be any fours anywhere else down these two columns and very simply vice versa if we go back and we made this the four instead, you can see that the same logic applies. We end up with fours in this, these two positions instead, no more fours in the column. Now, a swordfish, believe it or not, is nothing more complicated than adding on um, a few more a few more numbers. So let's let's make it instead of it being two rows and two columns, we're going to make it three rows and three columns. So let's add let's add another four there. Let's put some fours in the middle here in these positions and add a four on there. So now we're looking at rows two, five and eight and we've we've managed to locate the positions fours can go in these rows and we've noticed that they are aligned, i.e. they are appearing in the same column. Now in this situation, it's exactly the same logic. So whichever way, way we place the fours, we will find that the fours crop up in the same positions in the other rows. So let's, let's try it again. Let's say this was the four. Well, if this is the four, you can see that's gonna allow us to eliminate the four from these two positions. And we're going to end up with an X-wing of fours down here. So we don't know which way round it is, but it might be that way round. Alternatively, it will be that way round. But either way, we're not going to be able to place any more fours down column four, column six, or column seven. And if I just prove it, I'll just do one more four. And so let's say rather than the four being here, it was here. You can see that it's going to give us this arrangement, this arrangement, and again we've got an X-wing of fours left. Whichever way around we arrange these fours, it's just, for example, pick that way, no more fours are possible in columns four, six, and seven. So I'm sorry to labour the point, I know some of you will be familiar with the swordfish pattern, but I think it's important we start off with a common understanding of what we're looking for. Now, the only other thing I'll mention just for the sake of good order, we're using, I don't put them all here, here, and here. Now, sometimes when you're looking for swordfish, you won't find, you know, this could be the arrangement. This is still a valid swordfish arrangement. Just because 
there are only two positions for the four in column five and only two positions for the four sorry in row five and only two in row eight this still forms the same pattern when we start eliminating fours we'll end up with the same sort of thing it's just it's just easier to resolve this will be the four this will be the four and if we picked a different position to the four at the start if it said this four we pick one of the other two we'd still end up with a complete set of fours in columns four six and seven and again we'd be able to eliminate fours wherever they were occurring in the other positions down these particular columns. Now, so that's the theory. Now, very occasionally, this theory is extended a step further. And I'm going to have to, in order to demonstrate the finned swordfish, I'm actually going to use a real example which occurred in the Daily Telegraph last Friday. Um, so we'll look at that in a moment. Now, one question that we often get asked is how do you spot a swordfish? Well, a lot of it's practice actually. Uh, if you do enough puzzles, uh, you learn what to look for. So sometimes when I'm solving a very hard puzzle, I'll be looking along a row or a column and I'll, I'll notice that a number can only go in a two or three positions. And if I'm really stuck, and a swordfish is a technique you don't jump to uh, from the start. It should be something you're, you're using once you're, you've eliminated the more obvious strategies. I'll start looking in other rows for a commonality. Can I find that same number limited to the same um, the same columns that I found it in? For example, if I was looking at row eight and I noticed the fours could only go in this position, I might look at some other rows and see whether I could find a commonality. And let's say I found that in row five, I could find that the fours only go in these two columns. Well, immediately I'd be thinking swordfish here because I'd be looking for another row in the grid where the fours could only go in either this column, this column, and this column, or some subset of them. So again, um, this would be a valid swordfish, for example, if we were to find this. So it is practice. Now, if you want to practice with the help of a computer that's not a bad idea so what I actually did was I loaded up into some software this is the diabolical puzzle from Friday and this is how far you could get um, just with uh, basic technique uh, so you can see that in and the other thing this software does is it shows you all the candidates that are left for the particular positions now there are some useful things to find. There's a two six pair down here, for example. But if you look up, you know, you can't see any other twos and sixes in the column. So all, all the sort of basic elimination has been done to this point. Now, if we click on, there's a hint thing in this software, which is called Hodoku or something. Uh, if I click that, it finds something called a two string kite for the next step. Um, now we'll cover those in a different video, but what I want to show you is that we don't need to use two string kites to make progress from this position. We can actually use the swordfish. Now, how can we find where the swordfishes might live? Well, this software is quite nice because it allows us to highlight all the positions of ones, for example. So all I've done there is click on one and it's highlighted all the remaining cells that can contain a one. And what we could do is we could try and spot whether or not the swordfish pattern exists. Now the irony here is that the sword, swordfish pattern sort of does exist because you can see if you look at rows three, four and six here, the ones are limited to common positions. They are only appearing in columns four, column six and column seven. But, but the ironic thing here is there are no other ones in the puzzle so we can't actually benefit from this particular swordfish. Uh, it's not going to eliminate any candidates in these columns because there are no other one candidates. So let's move on to a different number. Here, can you see a swordfish? This is a good point to test yourself. So do pause the video at least when I'm flicking through the numbers, see if you can spot what, where a swordfish might go. Now here it should be clear that there, there isn't a swordfish. There are actually two X-wings, but again, we can't make any more eliminations. So the X-wings are these two here, that forms an X. But again, if we look up the column, we can see no more no more twos so we can't use that 
and there's an x-wing here as well but again there's no more twos in the column so again a useless x-wing threes well this is where it starts to get much more complicated so you know we can stare at this for a while um, and try and spot whether we can find threes being limited to just three positions in any one of these rows for example and find some commonality between them so you know for example if we look at row one here you can see that the, the threes are appearing in columns two three and five and similarly here two three and five but I think I'm right in saying if we look through there's no other row which actually where the threes are just limited to either the rows two three and five or a subset thereof so in fact no swordfishes or no obvious swordfishes in the rows that I'm, I'm looking for I'm only looking at rows here because um, I think looking at columns two would be step too far we don't need to do that fives you can see again we've just got two x-wings no nothing more sixes again complicated lots and lots of candidates A quick scan of the grid I'm not seeing anything might be wrong about that but I'm not seeing a swordfish let's look at sevens pause the video here if you need to I'll, I'll tell you there is a swordfish here so it's really worth studying well Actually, I have to be slight. I have to be slightly more uh, precise about that. I'm going to just, um, if it lets me, I'm going to eliminate this seven as a candidate. Well, will it let me? Yes. Okay. So now have a look for a swordfish. Um, I should have been a little bit uh, cuter there, um, but see if you can find the swordfish here. Um, and I've obviously given the hint there as to where it might live. Now, if we look here at row four, at row two, and at row seven, there is a swordfish on sevens. Why do I say that? Well, you can see that the sevens are limited to the same columns, the same subset of columns, so just columns um, three, six, and eight. And if this were, if this was the end of it, we would be able to eliminate the sevens from, for example, this square here. We could just remove the seven, um, this square here, um, and we might well be able to make immediate progress doing that. Uh, we replace those. However, the eagle-eyed among you may notice that I've cheated slightly. I've removed the seven from this square here. And a seven could go here. You can see the computer knows that a seven can go here. So you may say, well, what use is this? We haven't quite got a swordfish. Well, here we have something called a finned swordfish. And what does this mean? Well, without being too technical about it, it allows us to you ask one of these logical questions um, that I think is the most succinct way of illustrating the point in question. So there are two possibilities now in this puzzle. Either there is a swordfish, and we've talked about where that lives, or there is not a swordfish because this square here does contain a seven. A one of those statements must be true. Either this contains a seven, or if it doesn't, there is a swordfish. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that's interesting because if what that allows us to do is to hunt in the grid for squares that are equally affected by those statements, i.e. are there squares in the grid where, where whether this is a seven or there's a swordfish, we would have the same result. And there is one square and it's this one because if this is a 7, we can eliminate a 7 from this square. If this is not a 7, there is a swordfish. And that allows us to eliminate 7s from all of the unswordfished columns, if you, or positions in columns 3, 6, and 8. 
so we would be able to eliminate this 7 because of the swordfish. So either way round, we eliminate the 7 from this square. And this, this finned thing, or what it's really referring to, is a, is a cell that's sort of sticking out from the classic swordfish. That's why it's called a fin. And if you can find a, you know, a finned example, it is a rare fish. Um, but it's not that complicated to understand the logic. You just ask yourself the, the, the simple question, what if the fin contains the number I'm interested in? What if it doesn't? If the fin doesn't contain what you're interested in, you have the X-wing or the swordfish, the classic position. And then you're just hunting for squares that are affected by both, both statements. Here, we'd eliminate the 7, that would give us a 1, it gives us a 5, it actually completely breaks the whole puzzle open. And it becomes much more straightforward. So, slightly longer video than, um, than, than usual today, to, but that's because this I appreciate this is not the standard technique. Uh, I think the word swordfish strikes hit fear into the heart of a lot of Sudoku solvers who maybe haven't uh, you know, had it explained in enough detail. It's not that complicated once you get your head around it. You just have to, you know, go through it step by step. And I hope that this video is useful for that reason. If you enjoy the content, please subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate that. And we'll be back again soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.